So let's push on to our next speaker, Maria Alsner Pelt. She's she's there waiting in the wings. So she is ESG and sustainability lead at Concordium, and she's here to talk a bit about how uh, blockchain is igniting a trusted green transition. So Maria, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Fifi. I'm really excited to be here. Let me just find the clicker too. There we go. All right. Pleasure to meet you all. I am beyond excited to be here today. I'm with Concordium, a science-based layer one with a protocol level ID. And I could probably be talking to you guys for ages about how identity matters. It matters for accountability, but it also matters to enable for, because it enables us to still be private when we do our transactions. And I could tell you a little bit about some of the cases that we have with seafarer certificates for the shipping industry that make sure that everyone going out on, on the ocean is actually safe and they have the credentials that they claim without giving away their private information. I could also tell you a bit about some of the solutions that we're doing within gaming, where we make sure that it's not people that are underage that are actually playing games where there are prizes that uh, you can win. We have a really interesting company building as well that are doing tequila, NFT rare tequilas that you can redeem for an actual bottle of tequila. Although you can't really get tequila if you're under 18 in Denmark. So how do we account for that in a digital world? But thankfully for you guys, I'm not here to talk about the 40 very interesting projects that we have building. I'm here to talk about a topic that is really interesting to myself. So I'm a climate activist and have been for a lot of years now. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is the movement that we call ReFi or regenerative finance. And it's the movement of how we're using blockchain technology to ignite a green transition and to go into the topic of sustainability. So we're now three years into what the UN decided to call the decade of action. It's the decade of action because if we do not reduce our emissions globally by 43% by 2030, we will not reach our 1.5 degree challenge. And thankfully for us, we now have more than 140 countries that have actually signed up to net zero targets. A lot of them mid-century, and they're all doing their very best to cut emissions currently. We also have a lot of companies who have signed up to these net zero targets as well. Unfortunately, it's not enough. If we are following the trajectory that we have currently, we will actually rise our emissions by 7%. And that is putting us way below the targets that we need to reach. So to me, it's not the decade of action. I think we're moving into something we could call the decade of greenwashing. Because what companies are trying to do is that while they're trying to reduce their emissions, to actually follow through with some of the regulations that certain countries are setting up for them, they're falling a bit short because they can't reduce enough in time. And although they try to do the best they can, the data to provide them with the information about the journey that they're on is not really that easy to get insights into. I call it the decade of greenwashing because currently there's really not enough trust in what we do today. So what we've been tasked with at, as an ecosystem, I believe, is how can we actually build trust into the green transition? How can we help companies actually prove all of the good efforts that they're trying to do with reducing emissions in their supply chain, with changing out some of the materials that they're using, but also in the offsetting market, so with everything that can't be reduced. How can we actually build trust into that? To me, it's quite simple, and this is why I came into blockchain. It's because with this technology, we have the opportunity to create something that is immutable, can't be rolled back, can't be changed, that is transparent, at least if it's on a public blockchain, where you can actually see what's happening in the nitty gritty details of it. And then most importantly, that it's decentralized. To me, the global uh, warming challenge that we have is one of the first ones that is actually for the entire world to care about, because we will all eventually be affected by it. So to me, the fact that this isn't owned by a single company, country, is one of the profound things that makes blockchain technology so insanely well-suited for combating some of these challenges. And then obviously, because I need to do just a little bit of promotion, on Concordium, what I think will really help ignite this is the fact that we have ID at the protocol level. 
And that means that already just by having that, a lot of the solutions being built have a different sense of trust already built into it. You will know who's on the other end. Not that you'll necessarily know their entire identity, but you can trust that it's an actual person behind it. You can trust that the data that's being emitted is coming from one of the sources that you can actually verify. And I'll give you some few examples on how this identity is actually helping solve some of the issues that we have. So in our ecosystem, we're seeing three different pillars emerge in this igniting a green transition. The first one is what we call voluntary carbon markets. And it's a, an area that has grown quite a lot, especially also in the web free world in the past year. The other one is green energy certificates. And I think being in this place and imagining some of the power outages that we've already have, it's one of the issues that we need to care about and also make transparent. And then the final one is ESG reporting and carbon accounting. And I'll just for today go into the two first ones. But if you are a company that's interested in backing your data up and actually having the power to prove whatever is in your ESG reporting or your carbon accounting, we do also have some interesting solutions there. So you can come join us afterwards. But let's start with voluntary carbon markets. How many of you have heard of carbon markets? Yeah. Okay. Good. At least you have. I'm happy to hear. All right. So the voluntary carbon markets is essentially a marketplace where you issue, buy and sell carbon credits. And as I mentioned before, we have, I think it's 4,600 companies and one third of the world's largest companies that have set these net zero targets. And when they do that, one of the first things that they have to do is they have to look at what they emit and reduce it as much as they can. But obviously some of the deep decarbonization methods that we need like green fuels and all of these things are a few years ahead. So until we get to that point, companies have the opportunity and governments as well, even individuals have the opportunity to offset the residual of that emission to actually get to net zero. And it's a huge market, as you can see, it's 2 billion last year. It, it more than four doubled the value uh, from last year. And it's expected to reach about between 10 and 40 billion by 2030. So at the more people that are setting these targets, the higher the demand for these carbon credits will be. But there's only one issue. What are we actually buying today? So how many of you have tried to purchase a carbon credit online? One guy, I thank you for helping the planet, sir. The way it works today is that basically you go in on a website and there's maybe about 40,000 of them. You look at a nice little picture of a forest and you go, I want to buy that one. And you buy the carbon credit and I could potentially do it for the trip that I've been on coming from Denmark and down here. And I would buy that credit, but I would have zero information about where is this forest located? Who actually owns it? The people who made that carbon credit, did they have the right to actually issue a carbon certificate? How much of the money is going to go back into that land for biodiversity, for the local communities? And is the price right? So the market, the way it functions today is that it's, it's so opaque. We have zero information about what we're actually purchasing. And I mean, imagine being a company setting net zero targets, claiming to be completely sustainable, and then not having the evidence to actually build that up. So I believe the further that we get in this journey of everyone trying to be sustainable, there's going to be a higher demand for actually being able to prove that you are. Thankfully, we have a blockchain technology that will help us with that. And a lot of the things that has happened last year was some of these traditional credits that we have, which is sitting in centralized registry, they were bridged onto Web3. And it's a great solution because what we did was we actually enabled better access to doing something good. In my opinion, however, I think we're still a bit far behind from actually being able to prove what we're doing and if it's good. So I'll give you two examples of projects building in the Concordium ecosystem that I think are actually doing a massive job in changing and creating trust in the green transition. The first one is a company called Capitanix. So what they do is that instead of just ensuring that we have increased access, they're taking it a little bit further into what we call increased integrity. What that means is that it's actually one of the most data-driven carbon credits on the market today. They do remote censoring. They do LIDAR technology of the land that they own in Canada. 
and they made certain agreements with indigenous communities on whether they can sell the carbon credits on their behalf. 50% of any revenue coming in goes straight back to those communities, and 20% of that revenue is earmarked to go to biodiversity initiatives. See, this is a way of financing, actually, that we're doing something better, and we're bringing money into igniting green solutions. So the interesting thing is that with these carbon credits, when you buy them, all of the data that goes into that credit, it's attached to the actual token. So imagine an auditor coming at a point and going, oh, you offset it. Where? From who? Who was the issuer? Who did the verification? And you have no means of t t telling them what, uh, what information is actually in it. This is one of the solutions, in my opinion, that will help bring the transparency, but also the trust needed in carbon credits. Then we have another one that I wanted to bring to you guys. They are called Climify. And as I mentioned before, if you want to offset a lot of the time, what happens is that you go on this website, you find a beautiful forest, maybe in Bolivia, and you buy a carbon credit. But the issue is I emit it in Denmark. I'm so far away from the source of where I actually emit it, that there's no link between them. I'm not doing anything in my local ecosystems to regenerate where I am. I'm just pushing it off and far away. And where that might be good for areas where land regeneration is needed, but financing isn't there, I think it's important to look at companies where they have their operations and realize what they can do for the local communities to actually help ignite a green transition and bring more financing in to a better world. So what we have with Climify is to me insanely interesting. First of all, is it's a marketplace, right? So you can go in the same way you would buy credits or a stock or anything and buy these carbon credits. But because we have an identity layer on Concordium, what they can do is that in the smart contracts, they can actually account for whether you're allowed to buy a specific credit. So what they do in Climify is that they have this big area of land called peatland. It's like this little moss area, and when it's in a degenerated state, it emits carbon. But when it's regenerated, it captures twice as much as forest does today. So it's one of the best carbon sinks the world has ever seen. It covers 3% of the Earth's surfaces, so there's a lot of potential there. So what they're doing is that they're going out to landowners, they're teaching them how to regenerate the land, but it's very expensive. So the money that these landowners get from carbon credits goes straight into regenerating more of the peatlands. It's a financing opportunity in restoring one of the best carbon sinks that we have. But what it also is, is that when I buy it and I'm a landowner in, for instance, Scotland, I can ensure that it's only Scottish people that are allowed to buy that specific credit. So we don't have to sit and do a specific due diligence on our own. It will automatically happen. You will be banned from buying that credit. The same way goes on a company side. Oil companies are not allowed to buy nature-based offsets. You can account for that in the smart contracts as well. This is things that can't happen in the market that exists today. We need to do immense work on due diligence and transparency just in order to get to that. So to me, this is one of the best way of igniting a green transition because we're financing actual developments in restoring some of the green areas that we need to lower our degrees. And then there's the final case that I wanted to bring to you guys today, but I do need a little bit of water. I'm not a plan, but. So green energy certificates. You may not know this, but energy totally accounts for 30% of all emissions globally. That's a lot. So to me, energy is really at the heart of climate change, but it's also a solution to it because we have immense resources, wind, solar, to actually in the ecosystem around us generate some of the electricity that we need. But how can we trust these green energy sources? If you are a company, you have to report on your energy usages. You do that normally in a scope two setting where you look into what is the emissions or what is the energy sources that I purchased. How are you going to trust that they're green? The way it functions today, at least in Denmark and in large parts of Europe, is that all of the different energy is pulled into what we would call a bathtub, a little black box, and we buy certificates that claims to be green energy. 
but they're not linked to the green energy that was produced. So again, imagine you're an auditor or you're a company and you have to do your green reporting. How will you prove this to an auditor? Will you take your piece of paper and then hope that no one copy pasted it and showed it in another country when it sold over regional boundaries? We need to build the trust in. And in Denmark, we're quite lucky that we do have a national body that is uh, doing these green certificates today. And it's blind trust, right? We trust that they, the energy credits that they sell are actually also what is being produced. But we don't know. We can't see it on a blockchain. I can't access the information. And someone else is actually sending it to my house. So I have no way of knowing whether that is actually true or not. And when you are a company and you become liable for those reporting, and I mean liable, liable, Last year in May, the SEC did their first uh, criminal charges on ESG fraud. And Goldman Sachs was recently fined for doing uh, greenwashing just a few weeks ago. So it is something that companies will increasingly be held reliable for. But how do we prove it again? So this is one of the projects that I personally think are, couldn't be more well suited for blockchain. It's the Danish National Transmission System Operator. It's called Energinet. And what they're doing is that they're using Concordium to actually stamp all of the green energy being produced in Denmark. Instead of saying it on a yearly basis, what they do today, we're going to take it down to about an hourly basis of actually proving green energy when it was produced and matching it with a credit being sold. And that means that when we're traveling or at the end of the year, when we're maybe as a company, we'll have too many credits and we're selling them back to the marketplace, we won't have double credits. We won't have them being sold three or four times, which we're seeing today. We will have actual, true, trusted transparency in green energy certificates. And maybe that functions very well for a European market and this is an EU first project. But imagine here where energy is probably going to be fragmented and you're going to be potentially buying green energy directly from sources. How are you going to trust that it's actually green? How are they going to prove to you that that energy that they used is actually green? And I think some of these solutions is really what we need to build that trust into a green transition. It's what will get us from a decade of greenwashing to actually a decade of action, because this will again fuel more green energy projects. And it's about getting that financing in the system. So those were just three of the cases that we have building in the Concordium ecosystem today. I think an important part that I wanted to leave you guys with is in this green transition, which is 100% inevitable, there are regulations coming in. Even here in South Africa, what will happen in 2025 is that there will be a corporate tax on carbon. That means anything you can't reduce and you can't offset, you will have to pay uh, a carbon tax for. These markets, I believe, is the key to actually unlocking that there's trust in those taxes eventually that will be have to be paid. So with that, I wanted to thank you guys for listening in and we'll be just upstairs and you're more than welcome to come ask questions or find me on LinkedIn for those watching virtually. But thank you guys so much.